Good morning. Good morning. Man. And uh, to those on the front row, welcome to the front row. Thank you for tuning in. Amen. We do have some folks that watch, so thank you uh, for that. I'm going to be in the book of Luke, last chapter of the book of Luke, chapter number 24, page uh, 1113, if you have an old Schofield Bible, the book of Luke, chapter number 24. Uh, <clears throat> I was reading about, uh, while you find your place, reading about two men uh, who decided to go play golf on Sunday, and they thought it would be a beautiful morning, you know, playing golf, and they got out there on the golf course, um, and they got to... Uh, one hole, they were getting ready to tee off, uh, and they heard church bells start ringing. And one man looked at his friend and he said, you know what, uh, we, we should have gone to church this morning. And the other guy said, well, uh, I couldn't have went anyway because my wife's sick today. So, you know... Uh, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't going anyway, kind of like the, the two little girls I heard about. Uh, uh, they, they were going to play, you know, and one of the, the older sisters said, let's play school. And the younger one said, I don't want to play school. Uh, I want to play, uh, you know, uh, something else. I, I want to play grocery store or something like that. And she said, no, uh, I'm the oldest. We're playing school. And, and finally the youngest one said, okay. Uh, we'll play school. She said, now, mark me absent. <laughs> uh, yeah, mark me absent. <laughs> you know, that's the way a lot of folks uh, are about things in life, you know. Uh, all right, uh, Luke chapter number 24, I want to uh, begin uh, uh, reading at verse 49. This is when Jesus ascended. Uh, and he said, Behold, I send you the promise of the Father, of my Father, upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with the power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the reading of your word. I pray that you might uh, bless it, uh, Lord, that it would find uh, a lodging place in our hearts. I pray that when we leave this place that we would be better servants than when we came in. Uh, I pray that you search out hearts today, that one that may be as drifted, I pray that you draw them, and that one, Lord, that is uh, uh, far off, and, and then most of all, for that one that's lost. Pray God should speak to their heart that may be saved before it's too late, that one may be listening by way of the front row. Uh, God, it's no coincidence that they tuned in, and I pray that you stir their heart now. Uh, in Christ's name and for his sake, we do ask these things. Amen. Amen. Verse 53 again, and they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Uh, I read, it's been, uh, you know, recently, I can't remember the exact day, uh, but uh, a, a research paper came out uh, on church attendance. And uh, I believe it was Lifeway Research published a survey in April of uh, 2021 that said in the year 2020, 7,700 churches had closed their doors in the United States. 7,700 in the year 2020. That ought to disturb us. Amen? I know the landscape's changing. I know I read, and there's some more statistics I can give you that uh, you know, during the pandemic, 90% of churches closed their doors during pandemic, and a lot of them moved to uh, putting their services out by radio or uh, like we do here on, uh, on the front row through other venues. 
And the thing about it was that uh, a lot of them never came back once things had kind of quietened down. I find that most disturbing uh, because, you know, this country was built upon sound principles drawn from the Word of God. And, you know, uh, if you're, well, I, I'm old enough to remember uh, churches being in attendance and full attendance. And uh, I remember this church with folks, uh, you know, every seat being full. And some of you can remember that, uh, every seat being full. And I have seen it where we had to sit seats around uh, the sidewalls for folks to, uh, to get in. Uh, but we're not that way. And other pastors I talk to, they're not that way. I, I talked to one at a funeral some time back, and I asked him how his church was doing. And he said, Pastor, I, I, we're just making it. He said, uh, all of our older people, uh, they have either died or they're getting old, and younger folks aren't coming in, and things just seem to be drying up. And I said, well, what's your plan? And he said, well, we're doing the best we can. We're trying to reach people, but nobody seems interested. Uh, and so we're just continuing to preach the gospel and do what God wants us to do and see what God has in store. Uh, and that's disturbing to me as a pastor. Uh, I, I want to talk a few minutes about uh, why I go to church. Amen. Why I go to church. Now, this, this is not an indictment of anybody. I take it for what it's worth. But why? Why should we go to church? Well, uh, I want you to notice, uh, before I get to the message, real, by way of introduction, three things uh, that will be uh, uh, regarding our church attendance. There's a record that will be read. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, in verses 12 and 13 said, Now if any man build on this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be tried. That's what manner it is. Tried by fire, that verse said. So we have a record that's going to be read. Secondly, there's a reward that will be real to us. You know, we tend to think... Uh, about uh, awards or rewards in this life. And there's so many, you know, uh, maybe not so many for the average person. You know, Hollywood is great about uh, giving uh, award shows and all that, and, and I just call that Hollywood patting itself on the back. You know, I, I don't really watch those shows. They don't do anything for me, I, I, you know. Uh, uh, but listen, you and I, uh, if we work for God, uh, uh, can win rewards. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 14, Now by the faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. In fact, the Bible is based upon this concept uh, of two things, man's relationship to God and man's relationship to his neighbor. And Jesus brought that out in the New Testament when he said, uh, on these two hang the law and the prophets. When he asked the man, what, what does the Bible say? And the man said, uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and all thy soul, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And he said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Man's relationship to God and his relationship to himself. Uh, and that's basically what it boils down to. Thirdly, uh, there's a regret that will be realized for some people. 1 Corinthians 3.15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Amen. And so it's possible if we build up works for the Lord and they turn out to be wood, hay, and stubble, you know what happens to those when they're exposed to fire. They're burned. They're burned up. What we need is works of gold, silver, and precious stone because those aren't burned. They are more refined and they become more precious when exposed to the flame. Now, there's some things that, uh, you know, you want to protect from the fire. 
uh, amen, in this walk of life. You got things uh, in your home, uh, you know, uh, that you want to protect uh, from the flame. Uh, but listen, uh, our, our works are going to face the, the fire one day. What, qua what quality will they be? So, why do we go? Why do I go to church? Why do you go to church? Well, uh, number one is to please the Father. Amen. Uh, because his wishes, Brother Andrew, compel me to go to church. John 8, 29, And he that uh, sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always the things that please him. That's what Jesus said. That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be doing the things that please our Father. I knew coming up at home, uh, you know, uh, I, I tried to be pleasing to my parents, pleasing to my father, and, uh, because I knew Brother uh, Curtis that if I did something that I was displeasing to my father, I knew I was going to get punished, you know. And I would be sent out uh, to the woods to, uh, uh, to get a switch. You know, it's hard enough to, to, uh, to take a whipping with a switch, uh, but to have to go cut your own switch, that makes it even worse. And, uh, you know, Mom would always inspect them uh, uh, to make sure I didn't get a rotten one, you know. Uh, she wanted one. She would say, I want one that whistles, you know. Man. Now, I didn't get too many of them, but I did get them. And, I, and I'll say, uh, you know, I deserved them. Uh, I, I deserved them. Uh, because, uh, you know, as boys are, I guess, uh, you know, I was full of meanness uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes did things that I shouldn't do. Uh, but listen, uh, God, uh, the Bible said, uh, uh, chastens his children. So I go to please the Father. The, the Bible said uh, in uh, Thessalonians, Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk to please God and abound more and more. That's the secret to abounding or the secret to success in the Christian life. you got a lot of books on how to succeed in the world, how to be a better person, how to influence people, how to do this, how to do that. Well, all we have to do is walk to please God, and the Bible said we will abound more and more. Amen. Secondly, I want to please the Father uh, because his will commands me to go to church. Amen. Uh, the Bible said in Hebrews 10, 25, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. In other words, uh, God wants us to be in his house. Now I understand there are times when you cannot be. There are times when you must work. I, I get that. Uh, there are times when you are sick, and if you're sick, please stay at home, you know, uh, because I don't want it, <laughs> and nobody else wants it. I understand that. And, and there are some who are shut in, and they cannot get out, and we pray for them. Uh, but I'm talking about, uh, you know, I, I remember a message many years ago uh, in the New River Baptist Church, and uh, when Brother Fred Jennings was pastor there, uh, Benny might remember this, uh, and, and uh, I remember him, I don't know why this is in my mind, but uh, I remember him mentioning in his message one Sunday morning uh, that he had come uh, into the church and, and he crossed the bridge uh, uh, over the New River, and he looked down uh, on the bank of the river, and he saw... Uh, a couple of church members down there fishing. And he mentioned that. He said, you know, they ought to be here in the house of the Lord and not down there on the riverbank fishing. Uh, they ought to fish when they get out of church, you know. And, and uh, that stuck in my, in my mind. Amen. Listen, uh, uh, usually we can do pretty much what we, uh, what we want to do. Amen. Uh, and then his word constrains me to go to church. Uh, the Bible said uh, in uh, Mark uh, 1, uh, verse 21, they went to Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Amen. And so this was his habit to be in the house of the Lord, to the his father's house, he called it. Uh, secondly, why do I go to church? I go to protect my family. Amen. You say, protect your family? Yes, from certain things. One, I don't want my family to leave their Savior. Amen. I want my family 
to be saved. I, I'm glad to have two of my granddaughters here today. Uh, it's a blessing to have them in the house of the Lord. And they uh, have, uh, you know, professed salvation and, and uh, uh, know the Lord. And, and they, uh, uh, they watch, uh, you know, me on YouTube sometimes, you know, and they'll leave me comments. And, and thank you, girls, for that. Uh, uh, and I hope they pray for me. I sure need it. Uh, uh, but listen, I, I want my family... Uh, uh, to serve God, and, and I want, Brother Wesley, when uh, the time comes and we are not here anymore, I want to be assured that I will meet my family in heaven. I, I want to meet my daughters and, and my sons-in-laws and my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. I want to meet them in heaven. Amen. I don't want my family to be lost uh, and, and listen, so I, I don't want them to leave the Savior. You know, there are folks today, like in John chapter 6, the Bible said uh, in verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. He had been teaching them uh, about the bread of life, and he said, my, my, my uh, flesh is bread indeed, and, and my blood is drink indeed. He was telling them uh, that he was the bread of life, and they didn't uh, understand that. Some of his disciples or his followers, they couldn't hear that. And the Bible said they went back and they walked no more with him. Uh, you know, it'd be disturbing uh, uh, for one of my children or grandchildren or one of my uh, son-in-laws who, uh, you know, by extension is a son, amen, uh, it'd be disturbing to me to have them tell me, I don't believe the Bible anymore. Uh, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I don't believe any of that anymore. That would break my heart. Amen. Because you can't carry anything out of this life except what God gave you. Amen. And that is your living soul. Secondly, I want to protect my family from losing their saltiness. The Bible said in Matthew 5, 13, year of the salt of the earth, but if any, if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Now, I, I will I, I will say I have an affinity for salt probably, and I have to watch it, you know. Uh, I've tried to become more conscious and, you know, taste my food before I put salt on it. Uh, and uh, uh, Cindy cooks purposely, I think, and didn't put much salt in it, uh, you know, and that's good. Uh, uh, but she cooks uh, uh, some spaghetti the other night. The first thing I did was, you know, before I tasted it, I put salt on it and pepper. I love pepper more than I love salt, I think. But, uh, you know, I didn't taste it. I'd probably be like the guys in the Navy when uh, uh, Rick, uh, 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 who was it, uh, Rickover, Hyman Rickover, uh, the founder of the nuclear Navy, uh, you know, he was an admiral, and he invited uh, all these captains. He, he had been slotted to build this nuclear navy with now no more no longer diesel but with nuclear reactors in them and so he picked handpicked certain captains uh, that he wanted to run these uh, these submarines and he invited them to dinner uh, and they all came and they gathered around the table and the food was set out uh, and one of them uh, as soon as the food was set down picked up a salt shaker and salted his food uh, and uh, 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 Rick Over uh, after uh, it was over with, dismissed him from the select group of captains that were chosen to pilot these submarines because he said you should have tasted your food uh, before you salted it. He, uh, he uh, you know, reckoned him to be impetuous or whatever. So I would have been kicked out. I, I would have been uh, no good uh, uh, for that, you know. But listen, uh, 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 salt, uh, if you taste it and it has no taste to it, what good is it? Amen. So listen, if we are not salty as Christians, and I don't mean salty in the sense of, uh, you know, an old Navy guy. That, you know, you heard the old term, but he's salty, an old Navy man. I knew one of those one time, and every third word was a cuss word, you know. He'd been in the Navy all his life, and, and oh, man, he was uh, doing anything for you, a good kind of guy. But, man, he, he, knew, how to, uh, he knew how to burn the air, you know. Uh, and uh, he, he was, I don't mean salty in that sense, but I mean salty in the sense that we are the salt of the earth. We know the Lord, and, and brother, we are seasoned 
with salt. And so when you're around that group uh, and they begin to say things that are displeasing to the Lord, uh, uh, then we uh, uh, we can counteract that and say, you know, uh, 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 God is not pleased with that kind of action. Amen. Uh, we show the Lord. We show the Lord's work in how we interact with other people. I'll share this with you. I was in a meeting this, uh, this past week, a board meeting. Uh, and they were talking about some things, uh, uh, and one of them touched on a point that was, you know, near and dear to my heart, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I got excited. I, I said, uh, you know, something that was not kind, you know, uh, and it was, you know, not, uh, not in the best interest of the Lord. It, was, it just was unkind. It was just, uh, you know, and I thought about it, and as I was driving home, the Lord uh, said, you know, what is wrong with you? Uh, you, you should have spoken more kind because there are people there. I don't know their condition, whether they're saved or not. Uh, and uh, they know that I passed for a church, and I was like, man, they could have read anything into that because I should have been speaking with kindness. And and, uh, and so I wrote them an email. And I said, look, uh, uh, it's going to be another month or so before we meet. I, I was uh, not going to wait till we met face to face. I, I, I could, I, I should say it to you face to face that, you know, I apologize for, you know, my uh, tone. You know, I apologize for the tone of my voice. I, I should have spoken uh, better. I know better than that. And uh, 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 but I said I may not have the time. God may not afford me the time to wait and see you face to face. So I'm sending you an email to tell you I'm sorry uh, uh, for my tone of voice. You know, uh, and you know when I'm wrote me back and said uh, fine by me. I didn't see no problem, you know. Uh, and, but you say, why'd you do that? Uh, well, because God compels me to act like a Christian. And yes, I was bothered by that because my tone was not uh, what it should have been. And, and I should have been more caring and kind and, and, and you know, but, but listen, I, 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 we want to be salty in the Lord. And then uh, I, I don't want my family to lower their standards. Paul said uh, in Romans 1, 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, why did he say that? Because our body is the only thing God didn't save. God saved you. He saved your soul. He saved the inner man. But you're stuck in a body of flesh. Paul said, I'm in a war. I'm in a strait betwixt two. Uh, and he talked about that warfare in Romans uh, 7. Uh, and he said, you know, my uh, uh, when I would do something that's good, I find myself not doing it. And when I would do something that's not good, I find not doing that. Uh, and so he knew what the warfare was about. And if you try to serve the Lord, the devil is going to make sure that he attacks you on every angle. And he is going to try to bring you down. And so we have that battle with the flesh. Amen. If you don't believe it, get down to pray and see if the devil doesn't try to flood your mind with thoughts and make your mind run sideways while you're praying. Or, you know, try to do something for the Lord. Uh, the devil's going to try to do something to trip you up. Uh, we're in the body of flesh just like me speaking unkindness, uh, uh, you know, in an unkind tone, uh, unkind words. Uh, listen, uh, uh, now, some people say the devil made me do it. Well, uh, no, I'm not going to blame it on him. I mean, he's uh, he's there, but uh, I did it. I said it, you know, uh, uh, and, and it was me, and, and I have to own up to it and own it, take ownership of it, and say, God, help me uh, uh, to not live in the flesh. Help me to live in the spirit. Amen. And so, therefore, he said, present your body, that old dead flesh, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, thirdly, I, I go to church because I want to prevent the foe. Amen? Say, so who's the foe? Well, the devil. Um, the Bible said he's a roaring lion that's, uh, that walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I think it was in uh, the 1870s, maybe, uh, 1880s, uh, I can't remember for sure, uh, but uh, Colonel John Patterson, British uh, Army, 
was sent to Africa. Uh, he was an engineer, uh, but he was in the military. And he was sent to Africa to build a bridge over the Savo River. He wrote a book about it called uh, Man Eaters of Savo, I believe it was. There was a movie about it. You may have seen the movie. It was called, the movie was called The Ghost in the Darkness. Uh, and anyway, good movie, good book. Uh, uh, better book, uh, but good movie. But it was about two lions uh, that were attacking people in the area of the Savo River. He was His job was to get that bridge built over the Savo River and these lions uh, they uh, had assumed that they were brothers that were you know brought up as cubs together and some for some reason they had developed a taste for human flesh and they started killing men and they would catch them out while they were working and drag them in the field and kill them and then they got so bold as to come into the camp and they would drag men out of their tents and kill them. They went so far as to go into the hospital where men were sick and one went into the hospital and had a sick man in his bed and dragged him out and killed him. And so Colonel Patterson said, these lions have to go because they're keeping us from doing our job. And within the source of a couple of weeks, he killed them. One of them stood uh, over four feet high and was nine foot long. Can you imagine? Four foot high, nine foot in length. You can look them up. I think they're in, uh, there's, they stuffed them, and they're in London in a museum over there. Huge. But can you imagine being in the mouth of such a beast? They had just developed a taste for human flesh, and they didn't care about zebras and gazelles and all that stuff anymore. It was the humans that they wanted. That's the way the devil is. Amen. He don't care if he has to come in your tent and drag you out. He will. Amen. And so I want to protect my family uh, from uh, preventing the foe from uh, uh, because he wants to keep me from seeing sinners being saved. In Luke 5.10, uh, the Bible said, And so was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Years ago, when I was uh, pastoring at Lakeview, uh, we had, uh, you know, the we were typical Baptists. We had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And uh, uh, I can't remember if it was a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. One of the men that came, he was there all the time, faithful member of the church. Uh, I can't remember if he had to work. Something happened and he could not attend church. Uh, and uh, that night, I can't even remember what the message was, but I preached a, a message and somebody came and gave their heart to the Lord and got saved. And uh, he asked me the next time I saw him what happened at the past service, and I told him we had one saved. And he snapped his fingers. He said, man, wouldn't you know it? He said, that's the way it goes. He said, just the time that I don't come, that I'm not here, somebody gets saved. And I think he was on the, on the road for his company, traveling, I think. And he was disappointed by the fact that he wasn't in the service when that person got saved. Listen, the devil doesn't want to see, uh, want you to see those things. And, and he doesn't want to want you to see the saints being strengthened, amen. He doesn't want you to see the, the saved people who are being salvaged from the attacks of the devil. The Bible said, Luke 15, that he arose, came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, he had compassion ran on his neck and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is the prodigal. A lot of folks equate that uh, with a lost person, but the prodigal uh, doesn't, uh, is not typical uh, of a lost person. It's talking about a, a saved person who's wandered off into the far country. Uh, and down uh, in the pig pen, you say, well, how do you know that he was a saved person? I, uh, he got in the pig pen, yes, but uh, the reason I know he was saved was because he didn't stay in the pig pen. Amen. Now, and I got a message I'm working on. I hadn't developed it yet, but I'm working on it about, uh, you know, habitual sin. You know, there's a scripture that says uh, if we sin willfully, there's no more sacrifice for sin. A lot of folks get, uh, you know, messed up about that and wonder, you know, well, uh, if I did something uh, willfully, uh, you know, I'm going to lose my salvation and all that. That is not what that scripture is talking about. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but yes, uh, we sin. And yes, let me just give you this. If you sin, guess what? It's willful. 
It's willful. Every sin we commit is willful. Why? Because the Bible said the heart of man is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Uh, and if we did something, uh, we knew we were doing it, and we did it. You know, so it's willful. But God didn't say because you uh, uh, you committed a sin, I'm done with you. You know, that's not what He's saying. Uh, and, and I don't want to get off in another message here. That'll, that'll just, uh, uh, hopefully that, that will make you want to come back uh, and hear more about that. But listen, uh, uh, I want to uh, please the Father. I want to protect my family. Uh, and then uh, I'll come to church because my past is forgiven. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 30, 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou, listen, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Can you imagine? Now, I want you to stop for a thinking and for a minute. In your mind, in your mind, think of uh, all the sins you have done. Things that some people know about, and then there are sins that you would not want anybody to know about that you have done. You know, we all have them. We all got skeletons in our closet. We all got things that we have done that we wouldn't want our mother uh, to know about, our dad to know about. We wouldn't want uh, uh, the preacher to know about. We wouldn't want our husband or wife to know about. Uh, and, uh, you know, those kind of things we, we've all got. Then uh, there's some that we've done that people know about. But listen, guess what? God has cast all those sins behind his back. He doesn't see them anymore. He doesn't look at them anymore. This may be, you know, when Jesus said, if a man uh, uh, behind the plow turns his uh, head and looks back, he's not fit. Why? Well, one, because he's looking back longing for the old life. But secondly, the old sins, everything's back there. God said, I'm not looking back there. I forgot all that. I put that away behind my back uh, and forget about it. Now, here's the problem. Our mind, it's still there. Why? Because you're in that body of flesh. you still got the old man. You can still remember those things. Amen. God doesn't see them anymore. He doesn't judge you for them anymore, but you know about them. And guess what? The devil will slip upon you sometime, and he will scratch your memory, and he'll bring up some old sin, and he'll say, you remember that? And you'll say, yes, I remember that. And he'll say, well, uh, if you were saved, you wouldn't have done that. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, can, can anybody understand what I'm talking about? Listen. That's because uh, uh, the body, the flesh is not saved. And our brain that God gave us is a gigantic computer uh, that, uh, you know, remembers everything. Everything is there. You say, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, everything's stored because, you know, once in a while, uh, you probably had this experience. You know, I, I went somewhere not too long ago, and uh, I, I had a smell that I smelled, uh, and it activated something in my brain, and it, my mind flashed back to when I was a child. Something I hadn't thought about in 50 years, Brother Wesley. Uh, and, and it was, I was in, uh, for a moment, I was in my mother's kitchen. And my mother would cook on the wood stove and make biscuits and all that kind of stuff. But that smell, you know, put me back in my mother's kitchen just for a second. I had the other night, we were going through some stuff and cleaning out. And I still got some cleaning out to do. Uh, and Brother Grover, you know, loved to play the harmonica. And I got some of his old harmonicas. And they're in boxes. And uh, Cindy's, uh, there was in a box, Cindy said, what's that? I said, I think I know what that is. And I got one open, and I cracked it open, and I handed it to her. And I could smell it before she did, but when, uh, you know, she opened the box, she said, oh, it smells like my daddy. His, his essence was on that harmonica. You could, and for a second, Brother Grover was there, you know. That's the way the brain works. But listen. The, the marvelous thing, the miraculous thing is that the things that we've done, God put them away. Amen. Now, 
uh, and I know you're ready to go, so let, let me let, let me get get you out of here. Lastly, I come to church because I want to prepare for the future. Amen. Two things. Two things. The date of his return is hidden. Nobody knows. If somebody gets on TV and tells you they know when Jesus is coming, or they write a book and they tell you they know when Jesus is coming, don't believe it. The Bible said they would come in the last day saying he's here, he's there, he's in the secret place, he's in the desert. Jesus said believe them not. Nobody knows when Jesus is coming. Now he did say that there would be things that we could see that would tell us the time is near. And there's so many. He said in the last days, dangerous times would come. Perilous times, the King James says, but the, the word is dangerous. Uh, are we or are we not living in dangerous times? They were talking in men's prayer room about two shootings in Greensboro last night. Dangerous times. Uh, we, we're living in times now where, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to do away with the family. It's not mom and dad and the children anymore. Uh, but it's whatever, you know, uh, as I said in Sunday school, uh, you know, the, I, I read about some women who say they, uh, they identify as cats. Uh, I, I saw a fellow, you know, not long ago, he identifies as a baby. He's like 50 years old and he walks around in a diaper, uh, you know, uh, you know, and we got so much going on. Boys are girls, and girls are boys, and all that. Uh, what's all this all about? This is the devil trying to destroy the family. Amen. What God has made, what God has said. God made Adam, and he made Eve out of Adam's rib, and he gave them children, and that's all we got. Amen? And you are born as what you are. Amen. Uh, and... and well, I don't want to go down there this morning. You know what I'm talking about. Jesus' return is hidden. He said, watch you therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Talked about the good man of the house. If you knew what hour the thief was coming, he'd, be, he'd gotten ready for it. Therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man coming. Amen. So one of these days he's coming. Now, uh, there are other things that may be coming. I, I read uh, within the past week or so an article where one economist uh, or one uh, uh, guy who was monitoring the economy said uh, that uh, the stock market uh, is, is going to uh, uh, be good during 2023. And then I turned around uh, the same day and another one said uh, uh, it's going to turn upside down. It's going to be terrible. It's like the weatherman. They don't know what they're talking about. You know? They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and so, listen, uh, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I read an article last night about a four-star general who said that uh, his estimation that by the year 2025, the United States will be at war with China. I hope that's not true. But I, I take it more, more, with a grain, more than with a grain of salt being that it's coming from a four-star general because he knows more about military than I do. I hope it's not true because that means, you know, I got grandsons that are military age. I don't want them drafted and sent off to some godforsaken place, you know. But listen, but I know one thing, Jesus could come at any moment. And then the the date of our judgment will be an humbling date. Second Corinthians 5.10 said we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to whether it's done good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Amen. So why I go to church? All these reasons. Let's stand there. Let's feet. go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Raymond, dismiss us, please, sir.